All right. So here's the IRS story. This gentleman I'm working with has some, you know, the IRS says uh, he owes money. <laughs> what else? And it's a lot. I mean, just one of the years was like $80,000. And then it was 20 and 12 or whatever. And there's like three or four or five years of liability. Okay. And so he filed and didn't pay. And the reason why he filed, this is what I told the IRS agent. The reason why he filed is because he fears criminal prosecution. It, he didn't file because he owes. He doesn't believe he owes. He just filed so that, you know, you guys wouldn't say he's a, a, a non-filer or something, right? Out of fear. So anyways, this is a revenue officer. You got to understand who you're talking to. So on Wednesday afternoon or late morning, the, the in fact, the officer was really cool. He called, he called me and I'm the 2848. I'm the power of attorney, right? And the power of attorney, they always mess it up. And so... I always am on the call with my client at the same time, so we don't care about the power of attorney. But anyways, so he calls me before the scheduled call just to be polite and let uh, introduce himself and let let me know that he's the guy and he's going to be calling me and all, all this sort of thing. So he did all that. Then we all connected each other at uh, at the time. And uh, so the revenue officer was, you know, uh, began the conversation with this comment. He said, I want to help you work out your liability with the IRS. Okay, that sounds nice. And he began by asking questions about his employment. How much money do you make? Where do you work? Things of that nature. And I said, hold on a second. <laughs> you just told my client that you're going to work with him on resolving this matter, but you're actually conducting discovery as to where he has money. So you're asking him for information that would be against his interest in giving you. And you should already have it anyways. He goes, yeah, you're right. I already have it. I just need his confirmation. I said, well, he's not going to give it to you. <laughs> he's not going to help you. You go get it. That's your job. So what is it that what is it that we can do here? Because you apparently, uh, the IRS believes that he owes money. And so, and now, by the way, I, I already set him up so he's uncollectible. So I can speak like this. I don't care what the IRS does. I'm doing this for demonstration purposes. So the agent says, well, okay, starting with this year, there's $80,000. And then there's this year. I said, hold on a second, $80,000, where does that come from? How is that liability established? He doesn't have any problem paying it. He just needs to understand how it was established. He goes, oh, well, on this date, I mean, he had the transcript, or he said, on this date, a tax return was filed. Listen now, I'm not saying this. The IRS agent saying the, the debt, the tax debt comes from filing the tax return. Now, that's what he's saying. He's not educated. He's not trained properly. They deliberately put people that don't understand their job and they don't know the law to go there and, and get money from people, okay? So I said, wait a minute. The tax return was just filed because he fears criminal prosecution. What what I want to know, and he should know, which is a, a due process right, you should inform him as to when the debt, the $80,000 was assessed. On what date was the debt assessed? And the revenue officer goes back to the date of the filing of the tax return. I said, hold on a second. If the tax return was to pay a liability, how it, how is that the date of assessment? Doesn't the liability have to exist before the tax return is filed? He didn't quite get that. So I, I said, I want to see, and I'll let me help you with the language here. I want to see the record of assessment. There has to be an assessment from the government. There has to be a revenue officer who's liable for, for making a tax assessment. And on the assessment, he has to certify the, the accuracy of it. And he also has to disclose or identify the taxable activity or the type, kind, or class of tax and the regulation imposing the tax, the tax rate. All that stuff has to be disclosed on the tax certificate. So where's the assessment certificate? And he says, there isn't one. <laughs> I said, so what are we talking about then? He doesn't know anything for that year. What about the other year? You know, he goes, well, so we got stuck on this one year. And I said, look, if you don't have an assessment for that year, you probably don't have one for the other years. He goes, what's, what's the assessment? He goes, he says to me, you're trying to trick me. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, hold on a second. We want to pay the bill, but you haven't given us the bill. Do you pay the bill at the restaurant before the you know the waitress delivers you the bill? I mean, you could. You look silly. 
So he couldn't get that. He couldn't understand. I, I said, but you just admitted that there's no assessment. So if there's no assessment, there's no tax liability. You know, this is round and round and round. And, round. and, and in the end, he just, he just said, well, I'm going to proceed with the, uh, the final notice. And I said, well, what was the point of this whole conversation? If you're just going to tell us that you're going to go proceed with a, tech, a, a debt collection when there's no debt that you just admitted there's no debt, what are you doing? And just so you guys know, I didn't tell him this, but uh, there's a statute. You got to check this out. I used it in my first case, actually. It won the case. Uh, 26 USC 7214. When an officer of the United States is attempting to collect more taxes than are owed, it's a crime. And it's cause for an investigation, a criminal investigation by the FBI of all places. So anyways, uh, if you want to check it out. Uh, I used that in the first case I had where uh, we had pulled his individual master file and his business master file and found out he was being taxed for manufacturing pistols and revolvers, and this guy was a farmer. So I filed a report to the FBI. It was like a half-page letter, and within a month, everything was released. They they freed the guy. Uh, so anyways, what I, what I then told the agent, and this is a 20-minute call, I just said to him, look, if there's no assessment and you're just saying – we're going to proceed with the collection. You don't even listen to what I just said. You can't even listen to yourself. And if you don't understand, then, I mean, aren't you, aren't you guys supposed to follow the law? I mean, it's, just, it's like talking to a vegetable. So I said, look, here's, here's the thing. You can send all the notices you want. You can try all the levies. You can place liens. And, and that's the other thing, too. During the conversation, just before I said this, he says, so we're going to go ahead and place a lien. I said, I said hold on. You want to try to work out a payment plan. My client's willing to work with you. He's a friendly guy. He wants to work with you. I mean, you just told him you're going to take his property, and then you expect him to work out something with you? And the agent says, well, we're not going to take his property. I said, hold on. You just told me you're filing a lien. And I know you guys understand notice of lien, okay? Just, just know that a notice of lien from the IRS constitutes a lien, okay? It works the same way. And I said... A filing a notice of lien is the taking of property. Go look it up. That's the law. So you just told my client you're going to take his property and you still expect him to negotiate with you in good faith, but you're acting in bad faith. That's not how you negotiate. You don't take someone's stuff and then ask them to make a deal with you. You get the deal first. I'm saying this to you all so you understand how to work with people like this. Never, never, never negotiate in an adversarial situation like that. It's already adversarial if you're negotiating. If someone wants to make a deal with me, for example, in a settlement during a lawsuit, my first thing is dismiss the lawsuit. If you're, if, if I'm the defendant, right? If you want to negotiate with me, dismiss the suit. You can dismiss it without prejudice or contingent on, on us reaching a deal in a certain time, right? Or, or agree to another form of uh, dispute resolution. Like divest the court of proceeding forward with an arbitration clause. You know, so there's all kinds of things. But just realize if you're in a situation like that, like I'm talking to this IRS agent and he tells my client right off, he creates an adversarial situation. He tells my client, I am putting you in an adversarial situation with the United States government. Hey, you want to make a deal? Hell no. You warrant to me that you're not going to you're not going to place a lien on any of my property and you're not going to execute a levy. And I will then talk to you in good faith. But that's bad faith. You're acting in bad faith and you want me to act in good faith? I don't think so. So I said, look, this is this is wasting everyone's time. But just let, just let me inform you of this. I have painstakingly taken the effort over the last several months to strip all my client's assets and his income. And I've reorganized all of his wealth in such a way that the government will not be able to see it. Or levy it in any way. So file all the liens you want, all the notices of levy, and you'll get zilch, zero, nothing. Even when he dies, you'll get nothing from his estate. It was like I didn't say anything. Moving on to a different subject. And you guys can ask me about this. I mean, if, I, if you think I missed something, you can ask me some questions if you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to something else. So someone asked me just before the call about this, uh, I believe it was, uh, was it Wisconsin? Yeah, Illinois maybe is telling you for a driver's license. Now they want some biometric data fingerprint. Maybe they're already doing that in some other states. So look, guys, you got to understand something about licensing. I know about the driver's license, okay, the commercial aspects of it and all that. So the li a license is the payment of a tax, or let's call it like this. A license is the evidence of the payment of a tax for something that would otherwise be unlawful, right? 
it makes it legal. Because otherwise, if you try to do it like hunting off season, right, or hunting on someone else's land, you got to get permission, right? So a, a driver's license is the tax for something that, that you know would otherwise be considered illegal. So what is that? It's the receipt for the payment of a tax. What is the receipt? Is it the little plastic card you get with your photo on there? That is not necessarily the driver's license it is evidence of the payment of the tax right because it's it's valid if the cop runs it he's going to see that it's valid that is the receipt we don't see it that way but if i'm holding a piece of paper which you can still get to these days i think or on your phone or something you can show like in florida if i renew my driver's license i think it's 47 dollars. if i have a receipt for the payment of the 47 dollars, that's my license i paid the license tax to use the public rights of way the cop won't see it that way because they don't educate him. But I believe I can win in trial in trial court. In fact, I probably have to appeal it, but I, I could win on that on that issue that I paid the tax. So you stop me and I don't have what you're used to seeing, a driver's license. That, in fact, my driver's license said canceled, right? But I have the receipt that I paid the tax. They just didn't update the card because I wouldn't give them my my uh, my biometric data, you see. So my my answer to the question on what do I do when they ask me for biometric data and I don't want to give it. There's two ways to go. One is pay the fee, pay the tax by mail, send it to the to the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles or whoever will process the payment. Get your payment processed. Make sure it gets processed. Keep the receipt for that and keep it in your car when you're driving. Keep it with your expired license or whatever. Now, be careful. If your license is suspended, make sure that it's only canceled. I think it'll be canceled. Now, if they're going to suspend your license for not paying the fee, because they're not going to record the fee as being paid. It will be paid. Like if you're not going to get a receipt back, you have to send the payment in and get a money order. So get the money order for the receipt or the receipt for the money order. Okay. So just think that through, but you, you want your, um, your license to be canceled if it's going to be canceled and not suspended. Suspended is basically a warrant for your arrest. And it's leaves the, the police officer with his discretion or her discretion as to whether or not he's going to arrest you. So uh, it, it comes down to his personality. So I prefer to have a license that's canceled <clears throat> which divests me of some sort of liability as a resident. So that's another subject. But basically my answer to you is either pay the tax in that manner and don't renew the license the other way. And if the accounting function is going to accept the payment, which it should, I mean, if you pay it, the fact that you mailed it, let's say, for example, that is payment. So have a receipt that you mailed it and you sent a money order, for example, keep that receipt. Make sure the money orders a copy where it says Department of Motor Vehicles or whatever it's supposed to be made out to, right? So that way on the road side, if the police stop you and this sort of thing, remember with the licensing, they're going to, you got the insurance problem, it's all connected and the registration. So this is kind of a, a battle that you'd be taking on. Just keep that in mind. The alternative is give the biometric data and put a lien on it. That's why we have the security agreement. All right. So. I don't know if that's a solution. That's my recommendation. I'm sure that's coming to a neighborhood near me soon enough in my county, in my state. We'll see. Yep. <laughs> All right. You guys can't hear me? You can hear me. Okay. Batman, what's the problem, man? I think your computer's broken. Okay. So what we were talking about is, let me go to my notes here. There was uh, someone had asked me a question. Uh, I believe it was August 24th. They brought up the issue of the easements we we're talking about and um, the controlling possession of land in light of the Hawaii problem. The I guess there were fires or something going on in Hawaii. I think they're doing the same thing to Hawaii that they did to California. I think. And so I I, I don't like my answer. That's why I'm bringing this up again. So. An easement would allow you to retain possession or control of the land as an easement holder. But an easement is destroyed when the land is destroyed. So just keep this in mind. So I don't know what that means. Does that mean I have to excavate the land to destroy the surface area from what it was before? Or does it mean I destroy it in such a way that I don't have access to it anymore? Or does it mean that I destroy the natural resource on land? Like if I have a forest fire, does that destroy the easement? I'm not sure. I can just tell you that an easement can be destroyed if the land is destroyed. The land over which the easement is placed is destroyed. So just keep that in mind. But otherwise, still, I believe that an easement and control of the title, it, either way, is going to be helpful. I don't know 
what else is going on, but I can I can speculate that somebody there's some money interest in removing people from California at least to put up that high speed rail system or the uh, what do you call it the uh, the high speed rail whatever that is yeah it, which never got put up well they I think someone will do it but I'm just saying <clears throat> apparently Hawaii's on that list. And I, I, I understand that military weapons are being used to uh, destroy the land and, and make people run for their lives and then abandon their property. And then the government takes it and they don't have to use eminent domain. It's a way to get around eminent domain. If people finally figure out what's going on, they would just simply make a, a claim against the government for violating it, the eminent domain restrictions by the use of military weapons. Ooh. Anyways, so that's, that's the real – I should have I should have answered that question regarding the Hawaii land. In that way, so. John, could you repeat that that section of the IRS code that says that if they try to take tax that's not due, they can be uh, prosecuted yeah. by the FBI? Yeah, yeah. Let me go over this real quick. Just give me one second here. Okay. So if we go there, is this on? I, I, I broke it. Hang on. Okay. I'm clumsy today. Seventy two fourteen. Guess what? I was looking at the other day. See, it has to do with an officer of the United States. Okay. In connection with a revenue law. Guilty of extortion doesn't apply. Demands greater sums than are authorized by law. Could any one of you utilize this? I can tell you right now, I have before, and it's very effective. Etc. Would so, that include the fees that the IRS piles on to your original tax bill? Let's look at this. Look at this word. <laughs> okay you tell me it says any oh. fee <laughs> all right that's why i want to show you the statute here now i don't know why how i figured out i had to file a complaint with the fbi i forget how i figured that out maybe it says it in here somewhere i forget but anyways um i filed a complaint with the fbi for you know this thing and uh boy they jumped on that one yeah, the IRS just ran away. So they gave all the guys pro they had taken all his property from his farm. They took his cars and everything. Uh so yeah. <laughs>